that the level of enthusiasm and collaboration from the student body has been nothing short of amazing. Thank you, and well done to you all. Here today, without the efforts of our alumnus, Bradley, Boko, Amanpa. Bradley's vision and commitment are shown not only in his founding of SASM in 2014, but also in the extraordinary efforts he has made to bring this event to fruition today. Please join me now in expressing our sincere thanks to Bradley. It is now my huge pleasure to welcome our very special guest, His Royal Majesty Otunfuo Osei Tutu II. His Royal Majesty was installed on 26th of April 1999 and since then has become renowned for his transformational and inspirational leadership. He has received many accolades including the Pillar of Peace Award for his visionary leadership in restoring peace in the Kingdom of Dagbon in Ghana, from the Africa Premier Leadership Awards in 2020, the Chartered Institute of Marketing Ghana President's Special <coughs> Award in 2019, and was bestowed with an honorary degree from his alma mater London Metropolitan University in 2006. As a founder and patron of the Otunfu Osei Tutu II Foundation, he has expressed his clear passion for educational development and the power of education to transform lives. His dedication to education in Ghana is also demonstrated by his role as Chancellor of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. The wider aims of the foundation have much in common with the themes of the University of St. Andrews strategy, which looks to place our 600-year-old university on a strong footing for the future. Entrepreneurship is one area in which we share a focus, and the foundation's Autumn Four Entrepreneurship Challenge plays an important role in nurturing the next generation of Ghanaian entrepreneurs. His Royal Majesty is also known for his environmental vision. In 2019, he announced the planting of two and a half million trees around Lake Ozomtwe to protect the water bodies of the Asante Kingdom and preserve the land for the next generation. This is yet another area in which our walls align, with the St. Andrews Forest Project forming an integral part of our commitment to becoming a net zero university by 2035. Finally, on a personal note, I'm told that His Royal Majesty is rather keen on golf, another topic you can learn a lot about in St. Andrews. I sincerely hope that your visit to our town and our university demonstrates how much we have in common both on and off the freeway. <coughs> so with such distinguished speaker, it seems we are for an outstanding address today. And we have much more to look forward to during this afternoon's discussion <coughs> and formal sitting in state ceremony. However, for now, please join me in welcoming His Royal Majesty, Otomfor <coughs> Osei Tutu II. Mais ma propre vie, il fait un moment de 
Let me begin by thanking the St. Andrews Africa Summit and sure. the Master of the University for the kind invitation to deliver this distinguished keynote address sure. for this year's edition of St. Andrews Africa Summit. The last time I delivered such an address at the University of Cambridge, it coincided with the University overtaking its traditional Oxford rivals for the first sport in the University rankings. So, I am happy to note that this time round, the University of St. Andrews had broken the duopoly of the Oxbridge colleagues and leapfrogged them to take first sport in the rankings. Well done to the Vice Chancellor and the University for funding your success continue. So, your Africa Summit initiative underscores your commitment to the continued study of Africa, both academically and as a challenge to the evolution of human development. So, the continent presents a study of immense importance to our generation. So, only a few days ago, the African Union, representing the 57 independent states of the continent, was admitted, to the, uh, admitted to, into the G20, which until now has been the club of the global rich. So, whether this was an exercise in window dressing or a significant step in the process of global development, only time will tell. So, but at least 
The move underscores the point that Africa can no longer be taken for granted. So, the imperatives of global peace and harmony require everything both within the continent and in the larger global community about our place in the global family. So, we face the incontrovertible fact that Africa has been badly served by past history. Our history has been distorted and we have served, we have served periods when even our very humanity has been challenged. So, even crucified on the cross of Hegelian intellectual. Our generation now has the obligation not to whine and complain, but to stand up and challenge the distortions of the past. So, we hope great institutions like St. Andrews, through a forum such as this summit, will be part of the quest for the requisite positivity, rationality, and integrity in the study of African affairs that will be con conducive to the emergence of a new climate of harmony. So, it is the reason I'm here, to share our thoughts on traditional leadership in the modern democratic society. So, the last century was arguably the defining century of the continent of Africa. The preceding century had been, for me at least, the century of humiliation, when the entire continent was carved up in an orgy of colonialism described as the scramble for Africa. So, the first half of the last century was an extension of the preceding one, with all but Ethiopia, Egypt and Liberia under foreign control. So, the second half of the century, however, saw the dramatic change in the circumstance with the political emancipation of the whole continent from colonial subjugation. So, it will seem obvious, therefore, in considering the modern African democratic society, that the starting point would be the post-emancipation era, approximating to a little over the half, last half century. Unfortunately, I fear that will only paint a hazy picture of traditional leadership in Africa. So, for a fuller picture, we need to leap back in time to be able to feel and appreciate the evolution of traditional leadership across the continent through different epochs. So, we should examine a snapshot of traditional leadership in the epoch before the European invasion and consequential, consequential colonization. Then look at the role of traditional leadership during the epoch of colonial rule to provide the context within which one can fully appreciate the role of traditional leadership in our modern democratic society. So, it has become the burden of our generation to challenge the historic injustice meted out to our continent through the inhuman characterization of its inhabitants, our forefathers, as some subhuman species who needed to be dragged into civilization. As a corollary to this endeavor, attempts have been made to decapitate the continent by pretending that the nations of the north, such as Egypt, are not of Africa at all. So, such is the prejudice and the hate that since the power of Egyptian civilization cannot be denied. They must construct the subterfuge that no such civilization could come out of the so-called dark continent, and therefore Egypt cannot be Africa, so be of Africa. And yet whether you believe in or deny the existence of God, you cannot deny the existence of Africa as one continuous uh, continent. Its landmass stretching from the Mediterranean north to the Atlantic south and from the east to the west. In such a vast landmass, there is doubt bound to be, like all other continents, great diversity in outlook among its population. And yet, of laying such differences are the multiplicity of languages is a commonality of cultural organization and compelling evidence of the existence of African civilization in every part of the continent. So, assuming there can be no denial of the reality of the civilization of Egypt and ancient Carthage in the north of Africa, we will move to the south of the continent where the promoters of apartheid have sought to eliminate every grain of African humanity. So, even here, neither the impact of the Boer War nor the horrors of apartheid have succeeded in obliterating the magnificent organization of the Zulu Kingdom. So, or the kingdoms of the Swati.
they were before the European invasion and they are to this day models of traditional African statehood. So, move on to the heart of the continent, the territories of Central Africa. Here lies the Congo, possibly the greatest victim of colonial savagery, still suffering the travails of a tortuous evolution. It was, a, it was in April 19, 1885 that the Belgian Parliament granted authority to the Akin, Leopold II, to assume the position of head of state of the new African possession of the Congo. He was not to be simply head of state, but the Parliament stipulated that affairs of Congo would rest exclusively with the person of the sovereign. Zoom. In other words, the property of King Leopold, and he proceeded to manage it as such until 1908, when it was formally annexed by the Belgian state as its colony. So, how did the Congo end up in that predicament? Was it because the people were subhuman with no history and no descendable past? In the 50s of the last century, as the flame of African nationalism burned bright and the demand for emancipation of the continent reached its apogee, the Belgian government published some magnificent volumes, volumes of books designed to sanitize their rule in the Belgian Congo. Zoom. Between accounts of the horrors inflicted by other European powers that preceded them, the first volume of the massive book published by the Information and Public Relations Office of the Belgian Congo and Rwanda Ruli also attempted to assuage the head of the people by relaying some unpalatable truths about their history. Zoom. After recounting what had been discovered about the origins of humanity in the soil of Africa. The book noted that much of Central Africa had been, had been shrouded in mystery as a result of the absence of any written accounts of Latin, Latin monuments. So, the inevitable question was posed. Must we conclude from this that for nearly 2,000 years, Central Africa, cut off from European progress by the desert and by impassable rivers, saw only unorganized hordes similar to the human heads of prehistoric times? And the authors provided the answer, not at all. This is an erroneous idea. It is still believed in certain circles where people repeat glib glibly that until the arrival of the Europeans in the last century, the history of black Africa is one with, with prehistoric times. And the book goes on. As a matter of fact, the first Europeans who landed in Africa often found communities that were politically organized. Some of them, under the stimulus of the head of a family, who transformed themselves into a monarch, have even become kingdoms such as the Kingdom of the Congo, near the mouth of the river, Zoom. founded in the 13th century, or the Empire of Rwanda, on the frontier of Katanga, Zoom. created in the 13th century. There are many evidences of these Congolese monarchies. The very first explorers from Portugal pointed out that the natives there were more civilized than although they had not yet acquired writing skills as had the empires of Benin and Timbuktu in West. The political structures closely resembled the feudal organization of Europe in the Middle Ages. Zoom. In fact, the king had divided the country into provinces and districts at, at the head of which he had placed delegates chosen by himself. However, in certain cases, there were already popular elections, a kind of democratic counterweight in embryo opposing authoritarianism. There were rather highly developed techniques. The castle of iron and copper was known. Also, the art of pottery and the weaving of clothes so strong that the Portuguese used it as sails for their boats. Such so animals were raised, pigs, sheep, goats, and also poultry. Moreover, long before the arrival of the Europeans, millet, sorghum, banana, peas, squashes, and yams were grown. Such was the Congo, the official Belgian government publication tells us, when the Akin in Zinga in Timo received the delegate that the King of Portugal sent to him in 1484. Sure. Testament to his sagacity, King Nzinga and Timo immediately dispatched emissaries of his own to the King of Portugal, so, asking for masons, carpenters, agricultural laborers, and missionaries. In short, all the technicians he needed to help him improve 
the living conditions of his people. So, this exchange resulted in the establishment of a strong tie between the kingdoms of Portugal and the Congo. Based at the start, not on conquest or vassalization, but on an alliance, the two kings on an equal footing of, of formality exchanged ambassadors, and these diplomatic relations continued for many years. So, King Nzinga Timo was succeeded on his death by his son, Don Afonso, who continued with his father's request, father's quest for the development of, of the lives of his people. He opened the country to more Europeans and had his son sent to Rome to receive a classical training, becoming the first African bishop in 1518. Sure. Don Afonso established diplomatic relations with the Netherlands, Brazil, and the Holy See, and between 1504 and 1539, he sent three emissaries to Rome, Portugal. So, obviously, his assertiveness was displeasing to the Portuguese, but of greater consequence, <coughs> King Afonso was indignant about the vices which Portugal had introduced into his country. The Portuguese had introduced alcoholism, extortion and slave trade on a scale which was destroying the moral fiber of his people. An indignant King Afonso threatened to cut off commercial relations with Portugal if they did not stop. It began a period of turmoil in relations between the two countries, leading to an open warfare against the King Don Antonio and the crashing of the Congolese in the Battle of Impila in 1665. Sure. From that time on, the decline of the Kingdom of Congo was swift, crushed by military might, abandoned by commerce which had shifted to Angola and weakened by the slave traffic. The Congo was reduced to vassalization, and as a phantom state, it was finally dismembered definitely in 1885 when it was partitioned among the France, Portugal, and King Leopold. The official Belgian publication lamented that the privileges extended by the original alliance between the two states have soon been corrupted, giving way to trickery and violence and the alliance was transformed into such a vast system of exploitation that in 300 years it succeeded in converting into a gigantic slave market this country which might, might have known a better fit. So, the Kingdom of Congo was not the only one in the Central African Basin. The same Belgian Congo took also, book also recounts the story of the Kingdom of Bakabu as perhaps the most ancient of the Congolese Kingdom, certainly the one where African civilization has reached its highest point, and the only one which, frozen in a kind of proud conservatism, had remained at its ancient aspect down to the present day. So, the Bakuba are said to have settled in their present abode as early as the 6th century. Their history is not so much that of conquest as of the development, development of an original civilization, which organized a social system and sought out its own aesthetics. So, we are told that a taste for beauty is one of the dominant traits of the Bakabu, Bakuba people. Everything in this country is decorated, chiseled, custom boxes, cap, drums, walls of houses. So much for Central Africa, as narrated, not by some African radical, but under the authority of the Belgian Vice Governor General of Belgian Congo. So, what do we see in the East? As far back as the 11th century, the Kingdom of Mapungwe was trading with Arab merchants on the coast of the Indian Ocean. The Kingdom of Mapungwe, 1450 to 1760, had overthrown the Kingdom of Zimbabwe, circa 1220 to 1450, and was itself defeated by the Ozi Empire, which succeeded in expelling the Portuguese colonists from the Zimbabwe Peninsula. Sure. In 1838, however, a powerful army of the Shona clan, led by a celebrated Zulu general, Mzilikazi, defeated the largest Sona speaking empire, taking advantage of the heightened internal rivalries. British descended on the territory, managed to gain the signature of King Lopungu on a document purportedly granting him concession to mineral rights in the territory. So, from this flimsy foundation, which will hardly survive any legal scrutiny today, began the chain of events leading to the naming of the territory as Rhodesia and to its eventual annexation as a British colony. Sure. 
Away from Rhodesia, in today's beautiful Uganda, we have the powerful kingdom of Buganda, founded in 1818 and to this day in total control of its affairs within the Republic of Uganda. So, need I tell you about the glory of the empire of Abyssinia, the glorious Ethiopian empire, which is the only African empire to have successfully fought off European subjugation. Emperor Hezlasi may have been overthrown by his own military in our time, but his heroism will forever glitter in the history of our great continent. So, and, and so to my own backyard in West Africa. The three most powerful kingdoms of ancient Africa were the empires of Ghana, Mali, and Shonga, all rising in the land stretching from present-day Mauritania, taking in Mali, Guinea, parts of Senegal, down to parts of present-day Ghana. So, ancient Ghana began in the first century at a time when Europe was in the wilderness by establishing a lucrative trans-Saharan trade route between West Coast and the Mediterranean Seas. For 400 years, it maintained a state which, by any measure, was on a par with any European state. Internal squabbles led to the collapse of the Ghana Empire, but the predecessor empire, the Mali Empire, built on the legacy of the Ghana Empire and succeeded in creating what was to be one of the richest states on the globe. So, in Timbuktu, they built one of the greatest centers of Islamic scholarship and learning, teaching all the sciences, mathematics, astrology, and astronomy, creating one of the great universities in Islamic studies with a library of more than 350,000 books and manuscripts. By the sheer efficiency of organization and management, Mali became one of the richest states of the time and its most famous king, Mansa Kanka Musa, was regarded not only as the richest man of his time, but is considered by many experts today as the richest man of all time. So, when Mansa Musa made his pilgrimage to Mecca, the convoy of caravans he sent laden with gold almost sent the Arabian economies into a spin. So, the power of African traditional rule did not die with the ancient empires in West Africa. Near our time, we have the kingdoms of Benin, Ileife, and Oyo, and the Hausa Empire of northern Nigeria. And we have the Mosi and, of course, the Asante Kingdom. Each of these kingdoms, the empires, have evolved through ingenuity of their people, creating institutions of governance and organization appropriate and in many ways ahead of their time. So, to the extent that human civilization grows from the interplay of forces, there is nothing to doubt the capacity of these kingdoms and empires to grow organically from continued contacts with other civilizations without the trickery and treachery of colonialism. So, so what became of Africa? As all the continent fell under the yoke of colonialism in the 18th century. So, as I see it, the colonial endeavor manifested itself through two characteristics, what I will characterize as the Oriental model that is the French, Belgian, Dutch model based on the quest for assimilation, and the British model based on indirect rule. The policy of assimilation was premised on the proposition that the African was of a lower order of humanity and needed to be helped to rise or assimilate into a higher order, which was the European. It was the offering of the status of a semi skin prototype, a shade above the African, but still not good enough to be the full European article. Nothing expressed this absurdity better than the burden attempt to abolish Congolese nationality. Recounting controversies about Congolese nationality following the annexation into the Belgian colony, the official Belgian Congo book we have already cited confidently asserted in the 1950s. So, it is, and I quote, it is the unanimous opinion that Congolese nationality no longer exists. So, then, Having regard to the existing, of le ex existing legal documents re referencing Congolese nationality, it felt duty-bound to explain further. So, it is not a question of a nationality, but of a special status. Since the Belgian constitution provides that the can Congo can be governed according to special laws, it can be said that the Congolese are Belgians enjoying a special status. So, in other words, what distinguishes the Belgian living in the mother country from the Congolese is that the latter are Belgians with the Congolese status. 
So, this convoluted mishmas is further expanded as follows. The native population is ruled according to the extent of its evolution, either by the written statutes or by a native statute. The degree of evolution that permits the native to be placed under the written statute is officially recognized in the course of a special procedure. So, every Congolese has the right to be registered as soon as he has attained his majority according to the civil code. So, if he can show by his training and his way of living that he has reached a state of civilization that proves him fit to enjoy the rights and fulfill the duties stipulated in the written legislation. So, the French may have been less obnoxious and certainly better at, at managing the process of assimilation, but faced with the countervailing force of African intellectuals like Lepos and Gaul, um, Amit Cesari, Albert Camus, determined to assert their own identity, the assimilation enterprise had little hope of sustainability. So, it does have to be the British model of indirect rule that is of relevance here. British colonial policy acknowledged the primacy of a traditional governance. And while they did not endow them with the scope of development, they were nonetheless co-opted into the process of governance in a very practical sense. So, chiefs became part of the leg legislature. Some served in the executive council, which will be the cabinet of today. But more significantly, the traditional structure of governance under the direct rule of the chief remained undisturbed at the local level, leaving the colonial civil servants to concentrate on law and order, taxes, and the provision of such social services as education and healthcare as colonial rule would allow. So, this collaboration between the traditional rulers and the colonial administration served their purpose well. And when, for example, the Gokos was cited as a model colony, it was not because of Brit Britain had sent any special breed of colonial administrators. It was because the traditional structure on which the colonial authorities were riding had proven to be that much efficient and effective. So, but, but if it served the colonial order well, it will unwittingly open fault lines in the substructure of the edifice of the independent states of the future. So, for few of the nascent political leaders of the liberation movement fully appreciated the dynamics of the situation their traditional rulers had to navigate. So, conversely, the traditional leaders could not by themselves fathom how the relationship between them and their once loyal subjects would change in the emerging political environment. As I have argued elsewhere, it left a trust deficit in relation between our chiefs and our nascent political leaders which had a negative impact on the constitutional arrangements by which the countries regained political independence. So, for example, the British managed to accord special protection for the Kingdom of Buganda in the constitution of the independent of Uganda in obvious gratitude of the critical support the colonial administration received in the Kingdom. But it left a deep political scar in relation with Prime Minister Milton Obote, who eventually tried to abolish the Kingdom. Thankfully, the kingdom was restored and remains in full flow today. So, the political dynamics in Ghana, is, in Ghana preferred a different outcome. Efforts to give traditional authorities a sustainable status in the independent constitution would have failed largely because, as history tell, often tells us, we do not always appreciate the danger until we are in the grip of the elements. So, in Nigeria too, while the North managed to integrate traditional leadership at the time, the southern states were less obliging. It remains my view that the trust deficit created by the colonial circumstances in turn created the fault lines which gave rise to the instability of the post-independence constitutional order. So, we have in the past few minutes undertaken a journey into time, into the glories of ancient civilization in the mighty forests of Africa seeing the fateful encroachment of European colonization and the eventual subjugation of the continent. And we have arrived at this point where Africa has regained her, her political freedom. Now, we are required to examine how traditional leadership has adopted to the new democratic societies of our time. Frankly, one would have thought from the epic journey we have undertaken that the issue we are dealing with could be framed differently. 
namely how far we have gone or how successful we have been in ensuring that the new democratic ideals we have imbibed are firmly rooted in the African soil. Joe, that to me is the elephant in the room, or if I may, for Ghanaian political balance, the umbrella in the rain. Joe. In the half century since the political emancipation of the continent, the, the independent states of Africa have undergone bewildering experiences. Military coups, civilian wars, extreme farming have intertwined to create a far more edifying image for the continent. And it cannot be outrageous to suggest that we are still groping for the correct pathway to the realization of the aspirations of torchbearers of African liberation. So, from all the experiences of the past five decades or so, a pertinent question arises whether the political dispensation and constitutional arrangements on offer are adequate or appropriate of our circumstances. If we are honest, we will have serious doubt about a system which offers little or no scope for consensus building, an environment which demands all hands on deck, a system so focused on the winning and retaining political power that considerations of national interest become so serving to considerations of political party and private pockets. So, has it been an act of misplaced political indulgence for us to believe that democracy is one size fits all? Or a package for simple straight transplant? It may very well be in my view. I've always had a brilliant surgeon here with me in my team. And if I didn't know, at least he would remind me that there's nothing like a simple transplant. So much has to be done to prepare the body before a transplant. So, otherwise, <coughs> We read the trauma of organ rejection. As with the body, so it is with the polity. However, you package the system of governance and to only survive in the right environment. Unfortunately, we in Africa have been obliged to succumb to the proposition that merely transplanting a multi party electoral system is sufficient to guarantee the sustenance of democracy and achieve the development goals of the, si of the state. I fear this is a grave error, and I say so, not because I do not accept democracy, but because what we see only postulates a caricature of what democracy in its fullest sense should be. So, we have attested to the history of African civilization and governance going back millennia. We have proven how far Britain utilized and relied on, relied on the system of traditional government to ensure the success of its colonial administration. So, I would have thought that we would have sufficient confidence in what we have built, which has served us over the centuries to use it as a foundation on which to erect a new governance structure, and to then explore how we infuse the new ideas into them to give us a dynamic system appropriate to our conditions and circumstances. So, let, let us be clear. The French Revolution abolished the monarchy under the banner of liberty and fraternity. But democracy did not abolish the monarchy in Britain so, and the rest of Europe. The democracy was built on the solid foundations of enduring monarchy and much of Europe and the rest of the world is the better for it. What makes it impossible to use the traditional institutions of Africa as the foundation for the construction of democratic institutions of our new independent states? So, it has to be a matter of great regret that even after the failures of the initial independent constitutional order, we still surrender to the arrogant proposition that the true African creation is unworthy. I fear this perpetuates the old colonial absurdity which consigns all African achievements and creations to the rubbish heap. So, it is significant, that it is against this background, sorry, that we can now look at the role of traditional <coughs> leadership in the new democratic uh, state. From what we have learned so far, it should be evident that, with few exceptions, the constitutional arrangements of the new African democracy leave traditional leadership in at the peripheries of national governance. Within that limited range, much good is often accomplished. Traditional leaders offer useful counsel and advice to elected political leaders and serve as interlocutors between them and the ordinary people. As you all know, 80% of the population of Africa lives in the rural areas. The primary loyalty of this Mammoth community continues to be with their chiefs. 
Inevitably, their leadership is critical in the quest for development and prosperity of any country. So, contrary to the misconceptions of the times, the evidence is that wherever traditional leadership is strong, they are able to maintain peace and national cohesion. So, the issue for contemplation, therefore, must be whether the role of traditional leadership should be limited to the peripheries or whether it lies at this stage in our evolution, at the heart of critical decision making. So, I hasten to add that there is no expression of personal despair. In the 24 years of our reign as a Santene, we've had to deal with five presidents of the Republic. I can only pay tribute to all of them for the exemplary wisdom and their commitment to the common good. So, they've all accorded us the respect and honor being open to counsel as circumstances demand. So, but that is because they have all been decent and well steeped in the culture and traditions of their people and conversant with the influence of their chiefs. Their respect for tradition, however, does not hide the fact that the system of governance in situ places serious constraints on the role of traditional rulers in the governance of the nation. So, one would have thought, for instance, that the good, good offices of the traditional leader could be used more purposefully to facilitate dialogue between contending, polit contending political actors to encourage consensus building and minimize tension and acrimony <coughs> in, national political, in national political discourse. So, that would immediately create an additional layer of the support mechanism needed to sustain national cohesion and stability. <coughs> It is an option derived from our tradition which would strengthen the foundations of the democratic state, but which is not available now. So, we have seen how effectively it works as applied on an ad hoc basis in peace settlements. Is it not worrying that we cannot yet find scope for the application of the healthy traditional mechanism to facilitate the resolution of conflicts that adversely impact the economic development of the nation? So, I should at this stage deal with what has emerged as a matter of the greatest consequence to the fate of our continent. Is this a regrettable phenomenon of the resurgence of military coups in Africa? The first two decades of political emancipation, a spate of military coups rocked the continent and took away the first generation of leaders for the immediate post-independence era. Having gone through the experiences of that followed, the continent concluded that its fate lay in the orbit of democratic governance. And so it has been for the past two decades. So, the resurgence of military intervention suggests that something has gone seriously wrong. Let me make it categorically clear that regardless of the circumstances, I do not think that military intervention <coughs> offers a solution at this point in the evolution of our continent. So, there was a time when circumstances produced the notion that power flew out of the barrel of a gun. Those times are over and we face completely different circumstances now. The critical problem comporting Africa is the economy, from north to south, east to west, and all the joiners in the center. The burden is the economy. It is how we ensure every citizen and every family has food on the table. It is how we create jobs for our young men and women so they can stay and serve their country. It is how we find resources to provide education and health care for our people. It is how we apply the intellectual gifts with which God has richly endowed us to improve the conditions we inherited. We inherited. It is about how we mobilize the rich cultural resources for the good of our society. The state of our economies impinges on the security of our states. So, poverty and unemployment create instability which present both opportunities for these discordant voices. So, and yet, the simple truth of the matter is that there is no quick fix for economic mal maladies. In particular, it has to be stressed that there is no bullet that can deliver an economic miracle to, our, to any country. It has to, to be said, therefore, that military intervention is fraught with more dangers than it seeks to solve. It is what I consider a ride on a tiger. <laughs> Jumping on the back of a tiger is an easy bet. So, maneuvering the tiger, and particularly the smarter from the right, is at risk of the, of the cemetery that is better avoided. So, anyone in the military, therefore, would be wise to think before he leaves. As they say, the road to hell is paved with so, the best of intentions, and however, grievous the temptation, and however, genuine one's motivation, some precipitate actions may 
produce the effect of pouring fuel on an already inflamed situation. So, the problem you create may be worse than what you seek to solve. Having said that, we should also cl be clear that what is happening is telling us something we dare not ignore. It tells us that we have to do better at managing our economies, to break the cycle of poverty and unemployment and give hope to our able-bodied youth to remain and work for the development of the continent, instead of seeking the least opportunity to escape to greener pastures as well. It tells us that we cannot continue to outsource our problems and no African leader can sleep happy as long as there's an African boy willing to make the perilous journey of modern day migration. So, but it also tells us that something is gone out of a vaunted democratic experiment. That means urgent fixing. I do not think it signals a rejection of democracy as a system of governance. What I think it is doing is throwing into question the structures we have built within our democratic system. And that I would suggest reinforces the questions we have been raising about the constitutional arrangements of the African democratic states. So, I take issue with the notion that our traditional system of governance are wholly undemocratic and that political parties can better relate to and represent the interests of the people. Of course, we do not question the need for political parties. In every community, citizens may have different views on social and economic issues, and people should have the right to bond together according to their beliefs and political parties offer the necessary platform for this. So, however, the cultural and traditional beliefs of African transcend his political beliefs and therefore while they may split among political lines, they remain bound together by their traditional beliefs. Unfortunately, we appear to suffer from the misconception that political parties will link people from their traditional roots, such that their traditional institution could be rendered irrelevant. That has not happened and cannot happen for good reasons. So, primarily, no African today is willing to be cut loose from his roots, but secondly, because it is becoming clear that our system of governance is as democratic as any and offer a sounder foundation for the evolution of a new democratic superstructure. So, let me just give you an example of my own Asante king kingdom, whose system of governance reflects every Akan state. Contrary to the perception of old, the Akan state was not the feudal state of Europe. Every Akan citizen and family belongs to a clan, and every clan is linked directly to a traditional stoop. It is the occupants of these tools who are the chiefs constituting the traditional councils. In other words, the traditional council is composed of the direct representatives of all the families within the state. In Asante, we have gone further. We have created tools for communities of residents who are not citizens. Thus, we have the Anglo community who have been, who have been traditionalized in the Asante kingdom. The Fanti community and the Zombo community are represented in the Kumasi traditional council. So, the closest analogy one can make to our system would be to have representation of, say, the large immigrant communities like the African and West Indian and Asian communities represented in the British Parliament. So, deliberations are open and as rigorous and intense as you will find in any state legislature, but underpinning it all is the inviolable respect for traditional ruler, traditional order. All matters of adjudication or conciliation are conducted through an open, fully documented process, and all chiefs in attendance are called to express their conclusions. The beauty of it is that every chief always has his advisors and many may consult freely before stating his opinion. As an exercise in democratic practice, I will not yield to anyone on the efficacy and democratic nature of our process. So, we are able through our system of adjudication and conciliation and arbitration a myriad of litigation that would have paralyzed the judicial system. Our queen mothers are resolving domestic issues and leading the way to the empowerment of women at all levels. So the million dollar question is why it is still impossible to achieve a fusion of our traditional system with the new democratic elements that will give us a strong, sustainable structure. So we ask how such, surely, as, a, as an African setting, this is not impossible to contemplate. So, it is the reason I'm not overwhelmed by the enormity of the challenges faced in Africa, and the reason I ask the world community not to despair about the condition of our beloved continent. We are the children of immortal Pharaoh, 
the children of Mansa Musa, the heirs of Opinso Kino Seitutu, the, king, the, the children of King Chaka Zulu. We are what we are and what we were, and we will be what we are. Not the caricature of some photo, photo Europeans that history has portrayed us, but proud Africans confident of their destiny. We know where the destiny of Africa lies, where our future lies. So, Africa should look to its past to find its future. And that future can only be as bright as the African sun. Before some of us begin to run for cover, let me offer one assurance. The future is not clouded in revenge or retribution. It is the future of reconciliation and positivity and cooperation. Remember, my great uncle, King Brempe I, returned from 25 years of heart rendering exile, shaking no doubt but unbowed and called for the people of Asande Kiton to embrace the new reality and join together to build a new state of the Gold Coast, which is now Ghana. So, that spirit of conciliation has reigned with us to today. So did my dear friend Madiba Nelson Mandela, who walked out of Robben Island after 24 years to hold a hand of friendship to his captors and so he rather the collapse of apartheid. So, I have no doubt that African spirit of reconciliation will prevail in that future and will shine a new light through the darkness that today threatens to engulf the world in conflict. So, we need from the world communities understanding and support, genuine support to efforts to overcome the ravages of economic wars. In that setting, we can look forward to a strong, regenerated and developed Africa, enriched with the inspiration of its glorious past, so, sharing prosperity with the rest of the world in peace and harmony. And Ghana and Britain can look forward to a new era in which confidently celebrate the possibility of our historic ties and consign any of its hills to the tales of forgotten folklore. So, Thank you, St. Andrews for the opportunity to share our vision of traditional Africa in this predates my matriculation here at St. Andrews. As a member of the COVID class entering university in the fall of 2020, my peers and I found ourselves joining societies and applying to committees through online networks months before our arrival. After applying and getting accepted to work as a content deputy for SASM in the spring of 2020, I ended up working with every SASM team member for over a year and a half online before meeting any of them in person. I was then working in my second year with the co-director, Cal McIntyre, who asked me to take over his role as head of content. The following spring, he asked me to be his co-director. Working closely on the content team together from the start, Cal and I became a tag team, whose sole purpose for SASM really became the heads of restoration. Summit Heads of Restoration. What does that mean? As a result of COVID, the natural knowledge transfers between director to director or from old team to new was non-existent and impossible. The graduated teams lost touch and therefore oversight as to who took over SASM in that two-year limbo period 
brought on by COVID. Callum essentially made a long to-do list of administrative tasks in need of saving or revamping, dedicating his time as director for the summit to preserve what he could and re what to preserve what he could and rebuild what he could not. This includes saving our social media accounts, which possesses our outreach network and promotes our events, launching new team bank accounts, and reaffiliating our organization with the student union. It is vital to include Callum, who graduated from the university this past spring, in Sassum's story, because prior to being introduced to or working with Sassum's founder, who has set the organization's values, Callum already embodied the defining characteristics of Sassum. Passion for and dedication to the furthered ed education of himself and of others. Planning and hosting professional events, and providing an additional space and network within our university for students coming from within continental Africa and from those eager to feel more connected to Africa. Because of Callum, Sassum has persevered and persisted. Because of Callum, our current team has been able to focus on rebuilding sponsorships, on improving the production of our review magazines and other types of Sassum content, such as our graphics and our marketing capacities. We have been able to create new and restore old partnerships with student groups on campus, such as those representing SASM and their respective teams today, the Roosevelt Group and the Afro-Caribbean Society. The greatest of all, SASM is now able to focus on hosting prestigious events with prominent world leaders, such as His Royal Majesty, the King of Asante. Just as we did prior to COVID-19 in the winter of 2020, when Sassum hosted President Nana Akufo Addo of Ghana. Working with Callum has taught me about what kinds of people Sassum must be composed of and who I should surround myself with more generally. Sassum team members are defined by their resilience and flexibility. When hosting large events such as this, a team has to be able to get knocked down, mostly unfazed, and pick itself up again with every bit of faith that will recover move past an obstacle, prepare better for the future, and perhaps avoid facing a similar mistake again. <laughs> now, when hosting large events with team members living across the world, the team needs to be patient with one another, honest with what they can commit to, and trust that despite lags in conversation or meetings, that their teammates are true to their word and accomplishing their tasks. I can honestly say that my team accomplishes all of that and more. My co-directors, Mana and Pia, both worked incredibly taxing jobs this summer. Mana facing the intense and long hours of a finance internship, and Pia working in remote areas such as the Amazon and several national parks across Kenya, dealing with very little cell reception. It was always incredible to hear the progress that these two made despite the conditions of their work and their off hours or limited time with Wi-Fi. The efficiency and eff efficacy of their work cannot be overstated. Midway through the summer, my logistics and operations team took on the duties of the events team, whose head could no longer work for us. My head of editorial also manages to Sassum's web design and overall creative direction. He currently also sits in the back of the room, live streaming the event. My content deputy is serving as a photographer right now as we speak. My head of finance served as a caddy for the King's Accompanying Chiefs at the evening course yesterday. And he has helped the head of sponsorship on her leads. The head of sponsorship has also helped with event details, such as finding caterers for future SASM initiatives. I insist that these are only a few of countless examples I have, where teammates went from graphic designers to organizers of press releases, and so on. His Majesty, Otum for Osei Tutu the second. Monarch of the Ashanti Kingdom, and I know, including my very own grandfather, and I'll say today, Chidomine of Kenya City. Ambassador Edward Boateng, Senior Executives of the University of St. Andrews, Representatives of His Excellency the Ghanaian High Commissioner to Britain, Current Leadership of the St. Andrews Africa Summit, my family and guests of this esteemed occasion. First and foremost, I would like us to give a resounding a round of applause to His Majesty the King.
majestic feat that it is for him to travel this land just for us and I can confidently say that this is the highlight of my life so far. <laughs> Your Majesty, thank you for the honor done me, my family, the St. Andrews Africa Summit and the entire university. We are ever so grateful, Your Majesty. Almost a decade ago, after being here for not less than a couple of months, I had a rather interesting idea to boost the African, the profile of African affairs here on campus. I gave my good friend Hibak Mohammed a call to see if she would help me get it off the ground. And somehow she obliged. Mind you, she was two years by seeing her here, of Somali, Norwegian heritage, and Muslim, almost the polar opposite of me. I drew the vision, she built out the operations, and before we knew it, we had recruited an army of fellow students to come on this crazy journey with us that would form the first ever committee of the St. Andrews Africa Summit, just as Madeline and her team have done today. We sold tickets outside the library in shifts during our lunch periods and went around from department to department seeking support to pull off our first summit in 2015. We are so grateful to the people that believed in us from now until then, including the late Professor Ian Taylor of the School of International Relations, may his soul rest in peace, and His Excellency Ambassador Edward Barting, who joined us as our first ever keynote speaker back at the inaugural summit, when nobody believed in us. <laughs> Thank you. incredible pillar of support towards our milestone event today. Thank you, Excellency. It is my utmost pleasure to be back at my old stomping grounds, and I would like to congratulate us, as we've all done today, for retaining the number one spot as the topmost British university for the second year running, beating our good friends from the South, Oxford and Cambridge, once again. <laughs> Exactly 10 years ago, I found myself here as an undergraduate, beginning my first degree, now going on to my third. And if anybody ever told me at the time that I'd one day return with my president, the president of my country, and now the king of my homeland, I would have probably asked them what they drank that morning. <laughs> While very unseeming, Asante Man and Scotland are quite similar in my opinion both traditionally founded as kingdoms, now existing within wider states, Ghana and the United Kingdom, respectively. Both nations have very strong and colorful cultures, as you can see here today, visually represented in the form of the Scottish tartan and the Ashanti Kente fabrics, and share values of extended kinship, military prowess, and a deep appreciation for heritage and tradition. We even share a rather unique recipe the infamous Scottish haggis, a sausage-like pudding made up, of, made up of offal, which is a close cousin of my favorite Ashanti delicacy, boswa. <laughs> we both base our lineage on clan systems, each with their own totems and symbols, and also boast of our folk music and dancing, the royal reel here in Scotland, and the kitty dance of Asante Man, which you will see later today. Ladies and gentlemen, I could go on and on, but I'm not the reason why you're here today. We're here to see His Majesty. And so I thank you all once again for coming from near and far to witness this momentous occasion. And I trust that you will all take full advantage of the unique opportunity to see His Majesty sit in state, not in the Ashanti Kingdom, but right here in the Kingdom of Five. Thank you. <laughs>
once he is well, done, we must stand. stand. Actually, sorry, whilst they actually come, everybody just stand up.